Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've been able to bring us safe to your place of worship. And as we open our hearts to receive your word, may the Spirit take his rightful place and that we will continue to be loyal and faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, do you know this coming Tuesday? Do you, do you know the date for this coming Tuesday? October 22, 2019. Okay. What is so significant about October 22? Not this coming Tuesday won't be the great disappointment. I'm hoping not for many of us. Okay. But when we go back 175 years, those early Adventist pioneers experienced what? Great disappointment. It was taught, it was preached that Jesus was coming on October 22, 1844, and Jesus did not appear. So as we reflect uh, this coming Tuesday on October 22, 2019, 175 years since the great disappointment, and I'm not quite sure whether you want to look at the great disappointment in the context of celebration. But I want to leave three comments with you for you to consider and to pause. Straight after 1844, the servant of the Lord said, well, number one, Adventists should not forget their place in prophetic history. As a church, as a denomination, we should not forget our place in prophetic history. And then she wrote these famous lines, and, and I know that many of you have been able to recite these lines over the years. We have nothing to fear for the future, except we shall forget how, forget the way the Lord has led in our past, and his what? Teachings in our past history. And so as a denomination, we need not fear for what's going to happen for the future. We need to look at the past and to see God's guidance of his church. And then finally, the third statement she makes, that individuals, you and I seated here today, and many individuals across the world, must keep their eyes focused on the Savior. I love that, isn't it? I love those uh, statements by the servant of the Lord. I want you to take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. A, a well-known passage of Scripture. And so if you can find Matthew chapter 25... So, any of you can recall the contents of Matthew chapter 24. What is Matthew chapter 24 all about? It's about the signs of Christ's coming, isn't it? It's about the signs of Christ's coming. When we look at the next chapter, Matthew chapter 25, we have three significant parables in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 24 tells us what's going to happen before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 25 is also a significant chapter because Matthew 25 reminds us as individuals and as a body of Christ to do what we should be doing in preparation for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? So you cannot read Matthew chapter 25, independently of Matthew chapter 24. Nor can you read Matthew chapter 24, independently of Matthew chapter 25. You've got to read those two chapters in its context. And so often we, 
we, we neglect the reading of both these chapters in the context of Christ's soon return. So Matthew chapter 25 tells us about three parables, and many of us who would have heard these three parables while attending uh, kindy or the junior or perhaps senior Sabbath school. Matthew chapter 25, we have recited there, is the parable of the what? The ten virgins. Okay, so what is the lesson of the parable of the ten virgins? The lesson of the parable of the ten virgins is that each one is responsible for their own salvation. So that's the lesson of Matthew chapter 25. Each one is responsible for their own salvation. It cannot be bought, neither can it be transferred to somebody else. So each one of us is responsible for our own salvation. What is the next parable in Matthew chapter 25? It's the parable of the talents. And it shows us the necessity of using what God has entrusted to us. That's the lesson of Matthew chapter 25 when we focus on the parable of the talents. We need to use what God has entrusted to us. And the third parable in Matthew chapter 25 has to do with the sheep and goats. And it stresses really in this parable the importance of serving others in need. <clears throat> just, as much as, as we sh uh, just as much as we should read Matthew chapter 24 and 25 together, so should we be focusing on all three parables in the preparation of the return of Jesus Christ. No one parable, no one parable describes our preparation for Jesus Christ. Okay, so when you read the parables in Matthew chapter 25, we need to read those parables collectively because all of those parables reminds us and informs us and encourages us in our preparation for the soon return of Jesus Christ. And so today we would like to focus on the second parable. But before we focus on the second parable, it is interesting to note it is interesting to note the sequence of those parables. Now you may think, hey, look, you know, it's just placed there. The ten virgins, the talents, and the parable of the sheep and goats. But there is something significant about the sequence of those parables. Because the parable of the ten virgins has to do with that inner preparation, that inner commitment. And once you and I experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, once we have committed our lives and have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, the next part of that sequence is to be able to do what God wants us to do. So it's not transcribed well, you know, let's put the virgins here, parable of the virgins and the talents. It is very significant because Christ wanted to inform us that once our lives have been committed to him, once we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal savior, the immediate response is to be able to embark or to fulfill the task that he has entrusted to each one of us. And finally, the parable of the sheep and goats is all about you and I following that sequence from inward commitment to outward demonstration and then in a practical sense demonstrate to the world our commitment to our Heavenly Father. So when you look at the parable of the, uh, of the talents, now how many of you have read these uh, this parable before? Well, not many hands. <laughs> it's a great parable. So, if you have your Bibles in your hands, 
uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 25. And I want to start with verse 14. Verse 14 and 15 deals with the distribution of the talents. Now it's amazing that uh, one talent in years gone by equal to almost 33 kilos of gold. That's to some commentators, which have had the value today of one billion four hundred dollars. Oh, if we had just one thirty-three kilo kg, I mean a kg of gold, I don't know where you would be, Yvette, but I, I know where I would be. <laughs> Others have come to the conclusion that when you look at the five talents distributed, to the first manager, five talents in today's uh, you know, uh, monetary value is $2,000. Okay, so here's, here's uh, the master, and, he, and let's begin reading. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Okay, so he called his servants, here's $2,000 for you, and here's $800 for you, if I get that right, and, for, and to the one fellow, here is $400 to you. What is significant in chapter 15? Matthew, sharing this parable, says that each one was given the amount of money, what? According to his ability. So the master recognized that not everybody is able to produce at one level. So I'll give him 2,000 because... I know his background, his ability. He has the skill to turn the money over. So let's give the other fellow 800. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's competent enough, but 800 is sufficient for him. And the guy who was called and uh, given the $200, uh, the master realized, hey, look, you know, this guy is good, but he does not have all of the skills to turn the money over. And so he gave him $200. And then the Bible says <coughs> that these men went to do business, you know, for the master. Let's look at verses 16 to 18. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received, went away and dug into the ground and hid his Lord's money. Okay, so each one went their separate ways and they began to do what was expected of them. Well, the third one was expected to roll the money over and to multiply the 200 perhaps to 400, the 400 perhaps to uh, 800. So let's go to the account given by each one of those slaves. Let's uh, read verse 19. After a long time, the, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And the master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And then the one who received the two talents, the $800, he came and said, Lord, you delivered to me 
two talents, 800 bucks. I've gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Verse 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, repeating where you reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and I gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money uh, with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness and there will be gnashing, weeping of teeth, or weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, if I gave you some money, what would you do with it? I heard somebody said invest it. Okay. So, the person given the 400 dollars, what did he do? He dug a hole into the ground and buried it. And by the way, it was an ancient practice by many who fear that if they had the money at home or if they had the talents at home, somebody would break in and steal the money. So some people buried the talents, buried the money. You know, as I, as I was looking at the parable on the talents, I saw three great lessons in the parable of the talents that I want to share with you. Now, you may discover many more lessons in the parable of the talents, but I found three great lessons that I want to share with you before we dismiss this uh, afternoon. Three great lessons. The first lesson is the lesson of opportunity. Why do I say opportunity is the number one lesson in this parable? You see, the master gave everybody an opportunity. No one was discriminated. The only condition behind that is that the master recognized that you know, some have better skills than others, and others may have better skills than others. And that's why he said, five, two, one. So the master was not discriminating. He was saying, well, look, I know your capabilities. I know your abilities. And that is why I want to be fair with you all. And so in this parable here, God or the master was favorably disposed to the three men. Some acted on it, and they doubled it, but the one man did not do anything with it. And because he lost the opportunity, he began to blame the master. And you notice in the parable that the master did not reprimand him when, the, when he, the master, was, was accused by the slave. And I'm just wondering in our lives, friends, this morning, that all of us have opportunities. God is no respecter of persons. Where you are, where you come from, what level of education you have, what ethnic background you come from. God is no respecter of person. Everybody has an equal opportunity to make it. You agree with me this morning?
And so when we look at the person of God, like the Master, God has entrusted all people with a portion of His resources, expecting them to act as good stewards of it. You don't have to make reference to your scriptures this morning, but Luke chapter 21 verse 13 says, This will be your opportunity to witness. Galatians 6 verse 10, So, there, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Brothers and sisters, each one have equal opportunities in life. Don't blame your lack of opportunity or taking on the opportunity on somebody else. Are you with me? Don't blame the don't blame using the opportunity on your sort of family that you were born in. And let me remind you, if you think about that, if you think about, well, I should have taken advantage of this opportunity or that opportunity, it is not the start in life that is important. It is how you finish in life. And too, many, too often, many of us blame where we come from, what we inherited, and blah, 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 blah. And let me say that while you still have life in you, make the best of the opportunity that you have. Because like this man in the, in, in the parable of the talents, he began to blame the master he began to blame everybody else. And he failed to look at himself. And this is what this parable is all about. Look at yourself this morning. See where you are. See what you have been able to do in life. Some opportunities only come once in life. And there are some opportunities that come several times in life. And if you are struggling in your life to recognize whether this is an opportunity or not, fall on your knees and ask God for direction. How many of you owned a Kodak camera? One, two, just a couple. What is Kodak known many, many, many years ago. What were they known for? Now, the younger generation, you may know, not know what Kodak is. Yeah, for films. And they really had a niche in the market, Kodak. Kodak Eastman. I remember I used to buy slides for my camera, and they used to be the Kodak slides. But something happened in 1975. Kodak, as a company, produced the first digital camera, 1975. But they wanted to secure the film market. And so they put all of their eggs into the film market to secure it, to have the number one niche in the market when it came to films. But Sony and Canon recognize that the digital, digital market was reshaping the way we take pictures, etc. And what did Sony and Canon do? They put all of their eggs into the basket and they became the leading manufacturers of digital cameras today. 2012, Kodak filed for bankruptcy. 2012, why? Not taking advantage of the opportunities afforded. Number two, the other lesson that I found in this particular passage is the lesson of accountability. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 
So the first lesson is opportunity. Second lesson is accountability. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear, 5 verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, accountability. Second lesson. Let me share a second text with you. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to to his accountability. Have you heard of that word before, accountability? What do we mean by accountability? We have to be responsible for our actions. Are we accountable to each other here in church? Yes or no? Absolutely correct. Is the spouse, the husband accountable to his wife? And the wife accountable to the husband? Yes. Yeah, accountable but not to rule over. Are, are you with me? Okay. <laughs> and in this context, servant number three felt that he was not responsible. I'll use the word, he was not accountable to the master. I could do anything that I want. Why should I be accountable? So here's my, here's my one-liner. As you sit in the pew this morning, are you accountable to God? Follow-up question. In what way? You see, sometimes we live our lives as if we are not accountable to anybody. I'll do my own thing. He can say what he wants to say, and she said, I'll just do what I want to do. There's no compatibility, there's no accountability. So here's two men fishing. And they sit close to an overhead bridge. And every time a vehicle goes by, a part of the bridge will fall. Well, they watch another vehicle go by over the bridge, and part of the bridge will fall. Well, you can imagine if several vehicles crossing the bridge, what will eventually happen? Well, the bridge will collapse, and it did. When a truck passed over the bridge, the whole bridge collapsed. And so both these men looked at each other, and the one man asked the other man, what is the Christian thing we should be doing? Bridge collapsed. They realized that the next car coming near the bridge they go way down into the water. So they sit and they ponder. And so they ask the question. There's a bit of dialogue. As a Christian, what should we, or as Christians, what should we be doing? Well, the one fellow responded and said, we should build a hospital.
I think as Christians, sometimes we, we are like that. No sense of accountability. And finally, the third lesson in this parable is responsibility. Opportunity, accountability, and responsibility. Let's look at verse 30 of Matthew chapter 25. And cast the unprofit, unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now let me say this. Sometimes. Sometimes. And it may be circumstances. But sometimes we find ourselves in situations that we may not be able to control. Are you with me? But most often, we find ourselves in circumstances that we are able to control. Are you with me? And if we are not totally dependent upon God for His leading, for His guidance, then we've got to take the flack at the end. And sometimes that can be very, very painful because if I had to take responsibility for my actions, servant number three had to take responsibility for his actions. Come with me to Galatians chapter 6, verse 5. Galatians chapter 6, verse 5. For each one shall bear his load. Another, another translation reads, For each one shall bear his, or shall take his own responsibility. Let's put the one PowerPoint on the screen there. Thanks, gentlemen. And this was one of the highlights in this week's lesson, Bible study lesson, author Jiri Moscala, ultimately, we are responsible for what we do with the task or position God gives us. The decision of whether our task is completed or with excellence or mediocrity falls on us. Are you with me? God gives us opportunities. God does not discriminate. It's not because you come from this family or you come from that background or you have this education. No, everybody is on the same level. Everybody. Ultimately, we are responsible for what we do with the task or position God gives us. The decision of whether our task is completed with excellence or mediocrity falls on us. God will help us every step of the way. I love that. God will help us every step of the way. Are you listening? God will help us every step of the way. However, He will not do for us the work He has given us to do. We may have every gift under the sun. But if we are not using them for God, they are useless. So my question is, what opportunities has God placed before you? Reflect. What opportunities has God confronted you with? How we determine 
what God wants us to do and what the final outcome is, I take full responsibility for that. Colossians, I love that text in Colossians. Colossians 3, verse 23 to 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. God calls you to do something for Him, do it heartily. You're not doing for any particular person or groups of people. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I've got two one-liners that I want to share with you. Good stewardship of little things brings greater privilege and responsibility. Good stewardship of little things brings greater privilege and and responsibility. As in the story or the parable of the talents, poor stewardship leads to losing even what one has. And so the master took the one talent and he gave it away. Nothing left. Zero. Good stewardship of little things brings greater privilege and responsibility. Poor stewardship leads to losing even what one has. Just the final slide on the screen by Jiri Moscala. We each have to decide to put our all into everything God calls us to do in spite of opposition. We face opposition and distractions every day of our lives. But we need to put everything into God, God's hands. Ezra and Nehemiah could have given up, but they did not. They persevered because they fixed their eyes on God. The importance of their call outweighed their fear of negative consequences that arose from standing for the Lord. They were sure that mission was worth it. God is calling you this morning. He is calling me to take the opportunities that he is placing before us here today. What did Jesus do? One example of each. Opportunity. Matthew chapter, uh, John chapter 4, verses 24 and 25. Jesus meets this lady at the well. You know, the Samaritan woman at the well. In the dialogue, in the conversation, she tells, well, I'm waiting for the Messiah to come. And Jesus moved right in and he says, I am the Messiah. Have you heard of this uh, Latin phrase before? Carpe diem. You've heard it? What does it mean? Seize the day. Move in. Remember my lecture at Andrews, walking to the class, fellows are complaining, da, 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 and he would just say, carpe diem, take advantage of the day. And so Jesus practiced in his conversation and dialogue with the woman at the well, when she said, I'm waiting for the Messiah to come, Jesus went, carpe diem, I am the Messiah. He didn't beat around the bush. Another example of Jesus in terms of his accountability, um, uh, and you can read that John uh, 6 verse 38, he says, I have come to do the will of who? My Father who sent me. Accountability. I'm God, but I've come to do the will of my Father who has sent me. And finally, when it, came to be, when it came to responsibility, 
In John 17, Jesus prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and he prayed for future believers. So I want to end this morning by reminding you that God has not given us talents to, to, to God has not given talents to merely a chosen few, but to everyone he has committed some peculiar gift to be used in his service. Nor is everyone expected to perform at the same level of competence, but all, but all are expected to do their best as faithful stewards. So my appeal to each one of you this morning is a phrase. We either advance towards God or we slip back. Summary of the talents. We either advance forward to God or we slip back. What is your decision this morning? You have the opportunity. There's no question about accountability. And finally, what is your responsibility when Jesus comes? Father in heaven, we have been challenged through your word this morning that you want us all to be saved, but in, in preparation for your soon return, Lord, help us to take the opportunities that you have afforded us. Because ultimately, whatever the end result is, we will be responsible for our actions. And now may God bless us all here today and fill us with your Holy Spirit and may your Holy Spirit continue to become our guide and companion as we live our lives for you. We face many distractions, dear Father, but help us to be focused. May it be that we will constantly and daily Focus on advancing towards you. And we know that if we don't keep our eyes focused on you, we will slip back. May this be our prayer in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.